Hey guys, let me get my audio check in real quick. We got a whole lot to cover, so I'm not going to waste much time. Just take one person to tell me my audio is working prime. Sound is great. Thank you. Brindle Dark. Hey, buddy. Nanny Puffins. Slow down, Nanny Puffins. You can't just show up on other people's channels trying to fight everybody because they're lying on me or because they disagree with me <coughs> or because they misrepresent what I say. Girl, you all over the place. Yeah. I appreciate I, I appreciate the the respect though that you do that you do accord me. That is good. I appreciate that, Nanny Puffins. But you gotta get off that. You got to get off that Xena Warrior Princess attitude. All right. Uh, let's, let's remove that from studio. Hello, Otter. Otter Chris Topher. I've been seeing your name quite a bit a lot lately. George uh, Abdulner, I always see you. All my moderators. Okay. After this video, sometime tonight, I will be posting. There were so many of you, we literally had to create an email list and just go by numbers. It was just way too many people to fit into the raffle deal. So uh, we just put numbers in there. And then whatever number we pulled out, that corresponded to the email list. So uh, then we had to look up each email to find out who that individual was. I don't know. I don't know any of these people, guys. Um, uh, twelve. We have 12 winners. So far, this is just the first time. You guys know I'm liquidating a lot of my library. Not what you see here. The, these books here are from 16, 1689, uh, a whole shelf of 1700s, and the rest are 1800s to 1902. I don't know. I'm not. These right here are the archaics material. I've got a whole stack of books I'm sharing with you today because it's relevant to what we're talking about. It's relevant to this amazing book from 1871. Um, I presented this data in the past before, but we didn't take it seriously. Three people at the table were high as hell, and it was just a wrong atmosphere. My audio was terrible. It was it was a it was a microphone speaker that I didn't know how to use, so it war it, it, it warbled a lot. And uh, that information that information deserves to be represented in a more serious context, and that's what we're going to do here because 1871 cyclical flood theory is amazing. It's absolutely amazing because it makes sense of our world and it and it completely trashes using the same data it completely trashes ice age theory remember ice age is not a fact it is still a theory as a matter of fact it's 59 different theories because they can't even get it right yeah so we'll get we'll get into that we will get into that let's see Audio is excellent. Thank you, David. So we have 12 winners. Each winner is getting a book, a book from the 1800s. Each winner is getting archaics merchandise in the package. Uh, we change it up, throw different stuff in there. Each winner is also getting uh, uh, a, a second book. And that second book is guaranteed to be over 110 years old. And it, uh, uh, these are the 12 winners get. We're going to pick another 12 winners in the near future, probably at the Florida meetup. We didn't really have time. We were, we were really... We really had an awesome meetup in Houston, and we and we lost track of time. I even forgot to do the raffle. Somebody had to remind me. We just had time to do a raffle right there uh, uh, for six winners. A little twelve year old girl won. It, that wasn't set up, guys. It was that girl wanted it. She made that happen. She made that happen. That girl wanted that bad, and uh, she wanted to be a winner bad. You can just feel her energy in there, and she and she made it happen. It she really shocked us when we hit when we were doing the rotisserie. Went in there. All those people, we had over a hundred and something participants, and we pulled out her. Yeah, it wasn't. It, we did that in front of everybody, guys. It, it was not staged. It, it, I mean, I shouldn't be shocked because this is also one of the subject matters of my channel that we do influence reality. We can affect the field. We often do. We do it every day. Most of the time, we're doing it in the negative. But she did that. She did that in a room full of witnesses, and it really, it really, it really. I was taken aback. By, by being in the presence of such high energy like that, I had forgotten what it's like. I mean, I'm normally, I'm normally the one in, in uh, I don't know. I just don't know what happened. This little girl, uh, all, all hats off to her, hats off to her because she did that. She was like the star of the show. Didn't even know she was coming, but her dad's cool as hell. Met him, talked to him. <coughs> He's got de definitely got a reason to be, be proud. So 
Florida's going to be the same way, guys. We're still selling tickets for the Florida meetup. We're going to have a blast in Florida. Uh, we're already talking. We're already talking about doing something a little bit different. Uh, um, Florida's going to be a lot, a lot like San Diego, but I'm not having a bunch of guests. I may, I may have people contact me that want to come in, and I'll probably, I'll probably allow them to speak. It, uh, it all depends. Houston, Houston was just me. Uh, Martin has some court proceedings, stuff like that. He's not in trouble or anything like that. It's a, it's a court proceedings for, for uh, like medical disability stuff like that. And he was unable to come to the to the United States at that time. I'm hoping we can get him here in the near future. So. Um, but yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got people I'm in contact with and I, and if they want to come in and, and give a 30, 45 minute speech on the Florida event, I'm all for it. I mean, uh, if that's you, if that's you and, and you're also in the same position to me, you have a, you have a community and you listen, go ahead and contact me. Uh, I got a lot of good names from that post today. I appreciate you guys. I asked you for names of people who would be willing to come onto my channel that come from basically the Judeo-Christian background and would like to would like to discuss or debate the date of the Great Flood. I'll even give them carte blanche to go ahead and tell me what the what the date of the Great Flood is and to provide all their evidence before I before I even speak. Because I know the date of the Great Flood, and I know it by many different species of mathematical analysis. The calendrics don't lie. My archaic veterans already know what I'm talking about. But it's very easy, easy to show someone an accurate chronology once you understand exactly where they got their numbers. Yeah, guys. So I'm cool with that. I'm really cool with. I'm really cool with that. Yeah, Jamie Robbins, you can speak if you can get on that microphone and do it. <laughs> Uh, Florida, we're going to do something a little different. Um, Florida's awesome. Got, we got friend, friends in Florida. But I think we're going to, after the event, uh, we're probably going to make a late night of it. We're going to get a lot of good sleep the day before. We're going to make a, a lot. And after the event, we're going to pick somewhere, a uh, restaurant or something like that. We're going to go hang out, maybe a restaurant bar type deal. Something that can take all of us in there. And uh, we'll just go take over the place and, and, and we'll just make it public. And that's not something you got to buy tickets for. That's not the venue. Yeah, the, the venue that, you know, the venue that we're getting is insured and all that. But as far as coming just to hang out, if you didn't go to the event, you can meet us uh, uh, at whatever restaurant we post. We gotta, we're going to have to find a place in Tampa that can take us. It's got to be able to take 150 to 300 people, uh, something, some little outdoor venue, or maybe a whole food court with a bunch of, I don't know. We just have to figure it out. Figure it out. Talking about doing a hangout till about midnight, one o'clock or so. All right. <clears throat> nah, okay, 14, 40, 1,400 people in here. That's pretty good. Really, really surprised lately getting 44 and 4,500 people live at the same time. But then again, it goes by subject matter. And the crown was given to him. That crown was the corona, guys. You all saw it. There, were, there was a hundred million witnesses to the passing of the crown. We have left the first seal. We are at the very beginning of the second seal. For those who are anointed, for those, for those who are vibrating on a whole nother frequency, for those who are led by the spirit, who still have that connection to source, this is a show. It's an amazing time to be alive. That's what it is. But for, but for those who are still steeped into the lower negative base frequencies of the collective, who are still a part and participating in dungeon programming, who have not quite broke, break, you know, they haven't broken free yet. Remember, you got to break free or die trying. That's the whole point of an immortal passing through this construct. It's also the point of this video. Hey, Jeff Stout, my buddy. But, uh... <clears throat> That was my best friend in like third, fourth grade. We did we did a skit together. We did a little, we did a, little did I know I'd be doing skits in front of the whole world, but I did one with him in third or fourth grade. It's crazy. And we were buds for a while. We 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 separated and then we were buds again. Then he used to when I was a juvenile, he used to hide me from the police. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Then I got in real trouble and I just signed a full confession because I really I really wasn't the participant that they tried to make me out to be. I just signed a full confession, turned myself in, and uh, uh, Jeff Stout. He used to be, he used to be the guy trying to save Jason. Always trying to talk sense into me. 
But listen, the spirit wasn't ready for me. I, I was a prodigal son. I was supposed to go through a long period of darkness to come out to be the man that I am today. And there's nothing Jeff Stout here could have ever done to stop that. But I do appreciate the sentiment. He lives in Hawaii now. As a matter of fact, Don was talking about taking a trip out to Hawaii, Jeff. So you got my email. I would like to talk and discuss some of that. See, see about getting out there. Because I, I need to visit my publisher, too, on the way. San Diego. So anyway... <clears throat> uniformitarianism guys you got you guys know I already don't have any respect for it two scientific sc basically schools of thought one of them is ancient it goes back to the days of Pliny a naturalist a geographer Strabo another geographer historian named Diodorus Siculus these, these men lived 2200 2100 and 2000 years ago these men left us writings today that we have and they're fascinating they're fascinating. But these men were catastrophists. The reason they were catastrophists is just like Lucretius showed, and I have quoted Lucretius many times on my channel, the entire history of the world is punctuated by earthquakes and tsunamis that have destroyed whole civilizations. The entire history of the world. That, that, was, the, that was the idea up until the 18th century. In the late 1700s, we had a school start rising, trying, trying, to, trying to make tell a different story. They were ignoring the catastrophist evidence and now thinking that maybe maybe uh, some of these things that we see around us are, the, are after long periods of time. They were created in long periods of time and not from sudden catastrophes. Now on my channel, I've gone through, I have hundreds of videos where I show so myriads of pieces of, of data points and data sets that almost everything in our world is, is the result of multiple different catastrophes. I've even dated those and provide mathematical frameworks showing you different, the Nemesis X object timeline, the Phoenix phenomenon timeline, the dark satellite timeline. Those are three of the major ones. There are minor ones as well, but we don't, we don't have any evidence of uniformitarianism. The cities of South America that are found high in the Andes Mountains at 12,000 feet altitude were not built there. They ended up there moments after the entire South American area uplifted 12,000 feet. How do we know? I've shown the evidence on my channel. It's not my, it's not my research. I'm reading from the old books. And the old books, especially the archaeologist Poznansky in 1901 and 1902, who was on site, found the fossilized coastlines at 12,000 foot altitude, found the docks in the quays, found all the evidence of a bay and everything un underneath it was formerly underwater. All the archaeology, the most ancient archaeology, is all above the 12,000 foot imaginary waterline. The seas never change the levels. It never happens. The sea for thousands of years have, has always been basically the same exact level. What changes is the submarine topography, as I showed in 1902. Scientific soundings of U.S. geological survey ships showed in 1902 the water was only 600 feet deep. After the volcanic eruption in 1902 of Mount Pele, it was now 3,400 feet deep. The ocean level never changed. The, the beach didn't change. It's all still there. The, it's under the water. The submarine topography changes. Mountain ranges are created in minutes. Mountain ranges sink in minutes like Davis Island with 5,000 occupants sank below the sea. No one's ever seen it before. The giant granite quay in Lisbon, Portugal in the year 1755. During the Great Earthquake, transcontinental Asian European earthquake fell throughout the Mediterranean and Africa too. Probably a worldwide quake in 1755 had the people of Lisbon, Portugal terrified. A whole bunch of them ended up on one place they thought was safe. A gigantic granite quay right there on the edge of the city bordering the ocean. 60,000 people in less than 10 seconds vanished when the entire quay just went straight in the water. And the, and the in flooding water prevented nothing from coming up. Every ship in the harbor, every body, every article of clothing, everything that was floating, all the flotsam and jetsam from, that was thrown out, all gone. The, the ocean was clean. We don't know what happened to them. 
because that quay didn't just go down. It went down and kept going down in order to pull all those people so far deep. 60,000 people lost their lives in a second. This is the history of our world. It is a history of catastrophes. The uniformitarian model is a poison that was introduced was introduced and funded by rich oligarchs. I've told that story as well. Charles Lyde, Charles Darwin, these, these men are not the first. They're the ones that became famous for the idea of things being hundreds of millions of years old. I'm not saying the world is not hundreds of millions of years old. What I'm saying is the distribution of geographical features that we see and we call topography around us is of late provenance. It's all very recent. It's demonstrably so. We're going to get into a book right here, 1871. This man was amazing because 37 years after Charles Lyle had released that data that basically told the world, oh, look, man, we've got it all wrong. Everything, geology, well, here's a new science of geology. All these rocks prove that everything's millions of years old. Listen, none of that, none of that was true. Every bit of that was artistic license. Scientists revolted against Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin felt the pressure so much when he created the origin of species and uh, uh, basically put an outline together for natural selection, even though no pre, no, no, in, no um, uh, intermediate transitional life forms have ever been found. What we find fossilized is the exact same life forms that we find alive today. So. It's all uh, he couldn't he couldn't explain this. And at the end of his life, and they never cite this, but I have on my channel, Charles Darwin said that after looking and examining all the evidence, nothing could be truer than the fact that our world has been destroyed multiple times. This is 100 percent a uniformitarian statement. No, I'm excuse me, I'm sorry. It is a catastrophist statement. No uniformitarian could agree with that. These are the two schools of thought. They've been at war for a while. But funding is why you haven't heard that catastrophism is the only school of, uh, of world history that has been acknowledged since the scientists of the Alexandrian Library, since Lucretius wrote his most fascinating 7,355 line poem on the nature of the universe, which describes our world. And, I, and I've quoted him showing you that he knew about the Phoenix phenomenon. He knew about that the sun darkened at specific times and that the, and that the period was so, so long people forgot. Lucretius wasn't the only one. Pliny the Elder isn't the only one. I'll be doing a video on Pliny soon. We'll be reading out of his book. It's fascinating. Natural history. But these men, they're not the only one. They're not the only ones from the ancient world. I've, I've mentioned Strabo. I've mentioned Diodorus Siculus. These men were all catastrophists. But there's so many more that we have, we have those writings. It was only in the last 250 years that this uniformitarian poison has surfaced. Not only has it surfaced, but it was instantly funded. It was funded to, to and, and, and everybody's careers were modified because many people signed the contract. And what I mean is, is, is a lot of these people, in these, sci these scientific establishments, they're very smart. They saw the writing on the wall and they realized, damn, in their postdoctorate studies and in their peer reviewed materials, they realized real quick in the 1850s, 1860s and 1870s, they knew that something had happened. There was a there was a political shift. And if they were to buck it, they will never get funding or recognition for their fields. So botanist and paleobotanist and astronomers and, and ethnologist and archaeologist and geologist, they all got on board. It just took 30 years because they realized, damn, I can get funded if I write a book on paleobotany and I throw in their uniformitarian principles I can borrow from Charles Lyell. As long as I paint ancient plants under the guise of uniformitarianism, I'm gonna live like a, like like a fat like like a fat cat because they're gonna fund me. They're gonna put my books out, and I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna be shunned in peer review. This is what happened, 
anthropologist bit too. This was ha- this is a 30 year period, but there's one man I'm going to introduce you to who didn't bite. Not only did he not bite, but he couldn't stand this new idea, not just uniformitarianism, because he too kind of, kind of fell for some of the uniformitarian. It made sense to him. He kind of fell for some of that, but he saw that the uniformitarians were building a new narrative, and that new narrative was Ice Age. He took the exact same data as we'll show in this in this video, and he and he showed conclusively in 1871 that Ice Age is bullshit, and that all this data actually shows a flood mechanism that is unheard of. It is nothing like I have ever seen presented in any material before. It literally changes changes what the scope of the damage this was not a phoenix phenomenon event it could have happened in a phoenix phenomenon year but this is something else this i believe this man found the 2178 reset phenomenon which is attached to the phoenix phenomenon only because it's every 138 years but i think this man found a totally different mechanism that completely washes the slate clean. Yeah, we're not talking about the great flood of Noah. We're not talking about the Ogygian delusion 1687 BC or 2239 BC flood of Noah when the Mediterranean and the Black Sea were created in a day when the pillars of Hercules broke. We're not even talking about the Gihon flood when Enki appeared with 50 Anuna. 432,000 turnings of the stars, 12 centuries before the Great Flood in 2239 BC. We're not even talking about that event. That was 3439 BC, called the Gihon Flood. One third of the world, according to the ancient records, one third of the world perished. But we're not even talking about that. But we very well could be talking about the Adam and Eve reset in the year 3895 BC, year one of the ancient Anno Mundi calendar. If, if it's not that date, then we would be talking about 5239 BC, which is the very first year of the entire historical record. It is as far back as the archaic research will go because it's all we have. It's, it's the, all the data that we have only goes back that far. Remember, archaics is advanced research of chronological history of artificial intelligence X. I have literally de- deconstructed all the ancient calendars of the world and showed them to you what their origin was, how they, how they factored the passage of time, and I showed you what their begin dates were and what that means for us today. So what this man has found can only be something so systemic that is it is a absolute 100% reset of the world. It's far worse than the Phoenix phenomenon. But it's amazing because he provides all the evidence. It's, it's crazy. So, all right, guys. <clears throat> I'm going to introduce you to this guy. Make sure my chat's going good. Present, share screen. I'll just share that entire screen. How about that? All right. Now y'all are all in my business. All right. So, this is this is the the book, 1871. You have to understand, he's a scientist. So he's still speaking from scientific uh, perspective. Cyclical delusions and an explication of the chief geological phenomena of the globe. Don't get offended, guys. Of the globe by proofs of periodical changes of the Earth's axis. Yeah, this is going to go way beyond any type of temporal pole shift, lithospheric displacement. The mechanism that he is that he is describing, I have never come across anything like this, but it makes absolute sense. Embracing a theory founded on geographical facts on the true geological formation of carboniferous mineral. All right. This guy. Is William Bassett Walker.
William Bassett Walker. All right, 1871. Right there at the bottom, 1871. Carboniferous mineral, coal. I'm talking about here is coal. So we have to, we, we have to, let me stop sharing real quick. All right. So I just wanted to show you, this is the book we're going to, we're going to be talking about, but because he is focusing on carboniferous mineral, he is focusing on the distribution of coal seams, coal flats, coal fields, coal deposits distributed all over the world. He has found something that is so compelling for 1871, and yet he had not he had not put together what these other men had put together years later. Those books I showed, I have 12 books to show you that'll blow your mind the type of data that's, that's in these books. For example, we're gonna go through these books first, and then I'm gonna then I'm gonna go through the 1871 71 text. So you can really get a grasp of the data that he, he's presenting. This is Evolution Cruncher. I've told you guys about it. If there's anybody in the world who's still clinging to, to anything NASA tries to promote or anything the Uniformitarians promote, or, listen, anybody still trying to cling to that, you need to read this book. You need to read this book. This book literally dices through and shows you from other scientists who have pretty much discredited every scientific theory out there. Just go, they just going through them, just showing that they're all BS. It's all arbitrary. You are being deceived. It's all, it's all heavily funded. Now you have to remember, guys. Piltdown, Piltdown Man in 1912 was supposed to be the evidence for evolution. Scientific community got caught. 1953, another scientist came out, and well, first of all, in 1912, when Piltdown came out, they had it. They had a a specialist on dental stuff look at look at Piltdown Man. It was supposed to be the missing link. Oh, evolution is true. 1912 made world news. Scientific establishment, they, they funded encyclopedias, books. Now in 1913, 14, 15, all through World War I, World War II, what do you have? You have hundreds of millions of people educated that evolution is real. They came from a monkey, a chimpanzee, all because this little skeleton right here was said to be the missing link. This one, this one little piece right here. But this dentist in 1913, analyzed it and he published that somebody had filed all the teeth down from a, from a monkey it just appeared it wasn't a hominid there's this isn't a missing link somebody had filed the teeth down they shut him up 1953 scientists look, were looking at not, pill down man and all the people who were a part of the hoax by 1953 were dead they're gone so other scientists come out and they start researching pill down man they find out pig bones pig teeth they're looking through this whole thing and, and the entire skull what is 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 plaster there wasn't a skull there was nothing there but teeth and the teeth have been filed down to deceive other uh, other scientists this is the scientific establishment's proof of evolution they don't have anything else but they foisted that upon the people and it worked for a long time by shutting people down, by shutting them up. Yeah, Just like 1837, when Colonel Howard Weiss was almost out of funding and he needed to have a major discovery in the Great Pyramid. So he and another man went inside the Great Pyramid and painted using the dyes that are all up and down the Nile that have been used for thousands of years. He used the same dyes and he did a crude painting of Khufu's cartouche in, in the relief, Davidson's relieving chamber in the Great Pyramid. And then had somebody else discover, you know, go up in there and discover it. And then World News published that Colonel Howard Weiss made a huge discovery. He has affirmatively proven that Herodotus of Halicarnassus in 450 BC was absolutely correct in his book, The Histories. Khufu did build the pyramid. Absolute BS. But they silenced Humphreys Brewer. Because Humphreys Brewer came out and said, man, I helped paint that. You're a lying ass. We need that, 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 that ain't thousands of years old. But this is what the scientific establishment, which is also Egyptologists, this is what they do. They lie. They're no different than religious organizations, and they're no different than, than government organizations. That's what they do. They deceive you. So 
That's what happened in 1953. It was affirmatively shown that all that was BS. The whole story's in here with a whole bunch of other scientific discoveries. Oh, this is a fascinating book. Whole bunch of scientific discoveries that have all been disproven. But do they rewrite the history books? No. Do they rewrite the science books? No. No. They don't. Science will never admit to its wrongs, ever. So uh, this is 1953. Now, in 1958, two things happened. Two things happened. In 1958, NASA comes out. NASA is very heavily funded, and it's promoting the idea that, you know, all the NASA ideas, which are absolutely BS. We've been through that many times on my channel. Now, at the same time, in 1958, a massive, well-funded campaign was unleashed on the youth of America. Cartoons, comic books, and a massive amount of educational programming, all talking about evolution, natural selection, dinosaurs, just, just going off. It, it, 1958 is when this started. This, the establishment started heavily funding this false paradigm of uniformitarianism, despite the fact that they have been caught over and over and over lying about different artifacts. So I brought, I'm bringing these books to your attention because scientists have found many amazing things that completely overturn the uniformitarian model, but they're suppressed. You get them in really interesting books, but the interesting books aren't on National Geographic. They're not on the History Channel unless you're talking about ancient aliens. They're not anywhere that the ordinary individual will find them. You have to go to the specialist literature. You have to have a library that you have taken a very long period of time to build in order to find this data. It's not freely available. You have to really search for it. Even the William Cordes books I'm going to show you, I have the whole collection now, but it took a lot to get that collection. Yeah, guys, they are even this book, a lot of people say they're having trouble trying to find it. Evolution, evolution handbook. Other people say it's on eBay. Some people are selling it for three or four hundred dollars. Other people can find it cheap in a bookstore for five bucks. It's just where it is. It's just way it's, it's it's the state of things, guys. So also in this book, you're gonna find out human skeletons have been found in coal seams. How's that possible? How is that possible? If coal took hundreds of thousands or millions of years to form, if coal which is a fossil, you know, it's a, it's a fossil fuel byproduct. If coal really was what the uniformitarians tell us it is, how is it that we have found so much stuff in coal? Not in the mud above it, not in the clay below it, but the coal seams are packed with artifacts. Yeah, the fried bird skull, a juvenile jawbone of a child, Two gigantic human molars. Remember, in the vapor canopy period, humans are huge. Yeah, a perfectly formed human leg and a femur encased in coal. A gold chain discovered in 1891 in Morrisville, Illinois, dropped out of a shovel of coal when the coal broke up on the floor. A gold chain. What civilization met their fate in an incendiary firestorm that reduced all the people and all the wood and objects of their culture and civilization to a bed of coal that got crushed under a great weight. We don't know. What year did that happen? But it's all here. Remember, in archaics, I've promoted over and over and over, guys, we're in a programmed loop. Yeah, a lot of people waking up will make their exodus because the AI system that governs this entire construct no longer wants you here. You have become an errant. You have become a problem. But there's a lot of people who will loop back and start all over again and live through all these historical routines in the development of their more. They're not ready right now. They're not ready. They're gonna be. They're gonna stay on. They're gonna stay on this roller coaster another ride. All kinds of jewelry been found in coal seams right here in this book. A steel cube in 1885. Isidore Bronze Foundry at Volvo Austria. The coal was broken up in a perfectly ge a perfect geometrical steel black cube. A cube. Some type of technology. Fill out of a piece of coal. An iron pot. A perfectly preserved iron pot was discovered in 1912 at the Municipal Electric Plant in Thomas, Oklahoma. Remember, I told you guys about what they found two miles under Hevener, Oklahoma. It was a whole city infrastructure. 
I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you some more about that. So I'm just going through some deep, just going through some some of these. A child spoon found in 1937. Coal. Now we're talking about things. We're talking about 50 to 500 foot of depth. These coal seams and all these things are found in them. How they how they get there? Wedge shaped object. A metallic object, all found inside pieces of coal. Man-made objects suspended in rock. Objects that were made by people, here's a whole list, have also been found in non-coal materials like limestone. Iron nails have been found in the fossil record. Iron nails, one inch long. Gold thread. Yeah, gold thread embedded at a depth of eight of eight inches of stone. Stone that was broken up. Rock. Eight inches into that, a gold thread pops out. How'd that happen? More iron nails. Some iron nails have been found inside quartz. Wow. Okay. And it says right here, according to scientists, quartz does not require millions of years to form. That's BS. Anyway, I'm not going to get a silver vessel, a bell, a metal screw, a bowl of unknown metallic uh, uh, alloy, more iron nails. All these things have been found in coal seams. The list just goes on and on, guys. A small figurine of baked clay found at a depth of 320 feet in a coal seam. A bronze coin at 114 foot deep in uh, Chillicothe, Illinois. Illinois. 1871, found by well, drill, well, uh, well drillers. Yeah, this video is not about all these. I, I just knew, I just need you to understand that many videos in, in, in archaics present the data showing that North America is completely buried. There is an original infrastructure that was absolutely buried. Sometimes it's two miles underneath. Sometimes it's 600 feet. But North America was a thriving civilization. It was completely buried. And the Phoenix phenomenon isn't really adequate. The Phoenix phenomenon doesn't destroy things that, like that. Not unless it's, 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 the, it's the 2178 event. Mara Cakes veterans know exactly what I'm talking about. Only the 2178 event could really do that. Or the, or the 3895 BC Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve reset. That may have done it as well. Because we're talking about we're talking about ocean basins emptying. Yeah, the Great Flood is never the whole world. Never in the world's history has the whole world been underwater. So that's not how that's not how a Great Flood works. But ocean basins change, and new dynasties are built upon drying ocean beds. We've seen this many times. So yeah, there's. It, you guys just need to get this book to see. Or in the future, we might just do a full dissertation on, on, on Evolution Cruncher. That would be a long video. Tile paving in 1936 below Plateau City, Colorado, uh, close to Grand Junction. Somebody was digging a, cell, a cellar out, and the floor fell out from underneath them into a cavern, and they found tile paving mortar. I have no idea when this was built. Sometime in the past. The land that they bought from the United States was buried in a previous civilization. Crazy. Uh, some of these ruins are are, are uh, Miocene animals, vapor canopy horses, three-toed horses, like three-toed sloths, saber-toothed tigers are often found distributed among these types of ruins. Remember, I, in another in a previous video, I've also explained to you the underground cities in Mexico are far deeper than Tenochtitlan and the pyramid cities, and that William Niven had excavated at 25 foot depth and found a whole nother, uh, a, a whole nother layer of infrastructure down there. And it was mixed with, with human skeletons and mammoth bones everywhere. So with, with the pyramids and, and, and broken architecture. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah, this just goes on. It's a lot. Yeah, wooden, unrecognizable wooden things that were shaped by human hands. Just It just goes on. Uh, actual bones that have been carved into works of art. Rhinoceros horns that have been that have been designed. Designer rhinoceros horn, I guess. Yeah, we got a lot. So 
I'm not gonna I'm not gonna waste any more time. That's it. Evolution Cruncher has a lot of these things. Uh William Corliss of the Source Book Project, Strange Artifacts. Again, he focuses too on the coal seams. Like how did all these artifacts get perfectly preserved, but they're inside lumps of coal? See, we have a lot like American antiquarian in the original National Geographics. We have these testimonies because the ovens that were being used in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s require coal. Coal is not delivered like it is today. Today, we get, we get machined coal that comes in these small lumps, so nothing's ever found. And when it is found, it's, it's covered up. But in the 1800s, coal was delivered by wagon, and there would be a giant piece of coal, and they chipped off a big old piece, and then you carried this, this, this big lump of coal into your home, and you put it in your coal bin. When you needed coal, you would take a, a coal hammer, and you would just break a piece off. These are when these discoveries were being made. This is before they started prepackaging coal into small pellets. But people would open, would hit that coal, and I would I would pop a beautiful vase with gold and silver inlaid. Yeah, uh, we need you need to. I didn't I don't have the book here, but I read it I read it years ago. But Michael Cremo and Richard Thompson in Forbidden Archaeology talk about these things as well. So again, Unknown Earth, a handbook of geological and not. Uh, Enigmas. This is a book by a scientist citing nothing but scientific reports showing that we have unusual unusual uh, geology uh, all over the world that the uniformitarian model cannot account for. At all. I love William Cordes. Again, William Cordes, Ancient Man, A Handbook of Puzzling Artifacts. Again, this book is absolutely packed with things that you wouldn't believe that we have discovered. All kinds of things. They had electricity back then. They, and they, the end, I tell you all the time, it only takes 200 years to go from horse and buggy to Hadron Collider. So how many times do you think in about 5,800 years of recorded human history that we have been technologically advanced? Con when, you, when you break down the traditions to their lowest common denominators, we find post-reset societies that are always trying to describe things beyond their frames of reference. This is a great clue as to what is happening. A society begins to read and write hundreds of years after a reset. They're remembering through oral tradition things that are beyond their frames of reference, so it takes on traditional mythological tones. But when you reduce all these traditions and legends and lore to their lowest common denominators, you see over and over and over new societies after cataclysms are describing that technologically advanced cultures were existing at the cataclysm. So yeah, this is this is what we get. And this is what Lucretius said. Lucretius on the origin of the of the universe said the same thing in his poem 2100 years ago, uh, which was published in 53 BC. He said the same thing. History of the world is punctuated by cataclysms floods and earthquakes and that and that our whole history of the world is told in retrospect by the descendants of survivors this is that's what he said he's not the only one i did mark a page here what is this oh fossil footprints uh, yeah this is william cordes guys i have to show these things this is fossilized technology he's got a whole section in here of artifacts that can only be components to technological devices found where in coal seams embedded in feet deep of limestone how that happened how did it happen so all this is necessary so i can so i can so you guys can get a full grasp of what we're going to talk about in this scientist book from 1871 which has given us the business so, yeah, over and over, more curiosities from coal. He lists a bunch of things that are all discovered in coal. And again, we just don't understand. We just don't understand how the hell the entire world is full of coal seams that have these amazing artifacts in them with human skeletons. They've all been found in coal seams. So, all at different depths. Curious human skeletons, bones embedded in rock, human bones embedded in rock. Yeah. Oh, I got to do a video on this. I promised to do a video. Yeah, he's got a huge section on the antiquity of, of ancient American man. He's got a huge section on that. And all archaeology stuff. It's amazing. Yeah, I got to get out of that book. William Cordes, guys. It's an awesome book. Again, 
Handbook of Unusual Natural Phenomena. This two book, this bat, this book is also packed with scientific reports that are showing that the uniformitarian model cannot be true. It is missing too many components. It is not a workable model of our history or our reality. It's not the only one. We also have uh, William Cordes. You understand? This is the source book project. He spent his whole life amassing all these scientific reports, just like Charles Fort did. Again, here's. Here's Mysterious Universe, a handbook of astronomical anom anomalies. Again, the astronomy does not support the uniformitarian model at all. And speak of the devil, Charles Fort. The complete works of Charles Fort, right here. Book of the Damned, Low, New Lands, Wild Talents. Those are the four books of Charles Fort. Recommended reading. If you don't read anything in your life, you should read the complete works of Charles Fort because they will completely change your idea of what you previously thought the type of world was that you live in. You can't read this book, which is nothing but scientific reports, reports and eyewitness accounts taken from all over the world, 500 years of collected data by a, by a man who, who, that's all he did. He just collected all this data and put it all together for you to see. He throws some opinions in there. He's real cynical. Uh, I, I love his humor, but you know what? You can't finish the complete work, works of Charles Fort and still think you live in the world presented by uniformitarians. You can't. To be a uniformitarian today, you have to be brainwashed into collective educational programming. Anybody, anybody now promoting uniformitarianism they are 100% brainwashed and they're brainwashed because they have absolutely refused to look at all the things that overturn the uniformitarian model. So again, Darwin's mistake is another fantastic model, uh, a model, I said bottle, a uh, book that shows you that science today is full of shit. Absolutely full of shit. This book is fascinating, full of pictures. And again, Coal scenes again. He goes into and explains it doesn't. It doesn't even make sense. Everything that has been found in coal coal deposits doesn't even make sense. According because it just it's crazy, it's just crazy. But uh, yeah, he goes into. He's got another list. Some of some there's some crossover with with the other list, but he's talking about thimbles, just a sewing thimble, thimbles that have been found in impossible places. Reported in American Antiquarian. Hammers that have been found in, in solid rock. A whole kettle that was found inside a, a coal seam. How did that happen? It's got some interesting pictures. A coal seam that has a three-toed reptile print in the ceiling. It's coal, but there's a three-toed reptile print upside down in the ceiling. How did that happen? A lot of stuff in this book. This is another. This is another. This is another one I would I would recommend people look at. Yeah, you guys know the Antikythera computer. You guys, I've talked about it. I've showed you guys that that it's probably it's probably modeled after the 583 BC uh, Phoenix phenomenon. That there are historical texts that talk about a device just like this that was used by Thales of Miletus when he predicted the sun darkening. And we know that the prediction of the sun darkening was not an eclipse. It was, it was the Phoenix phenomenon. So technological artifacts that have been found. He goes into it in this book too, saying that, look, there, there's too many of them that have been found and suppressed for us to ever believe the uniformitarian model. The uniformitarian model promotes that we came from more primitive hominid forms and that <laughs> event uh, uh, different over hundreds of thousands and millions of years present humans developed from these hominids. Uniformitarian is absolute bullshit. There is no way we would have ever been survived. Well when you look at the when you look at the record of everything that was living in this world in different biospheres, we would have never survived that. Never survived all that. We, we would have been eaten off the world a long time ago. It's crazy. All right, so this, this is a little book that I, that, that I would uh, definitely... <clears throat> oh, this is a real good one. This is Source Book Project. Uniformitarianism has to ignore everything in this book. Neglected geological anomalies. They are neglected because they do not fit the model. They just don't fit it. They do fit the catastrophist model. 
uh, some of you guys deep in the mud floods and some of you guys that are real deep into the uh, um, anybody doing mud flood research and anybody doing meltology research, you need to get the whole collection of William Cordes. You're going to find a lot of the information that it's very difficult to find. You're going to find all of it. You'll have you'll have endless amounts of videos to do out of the William Cordes deal. I, pro I promote that. Yeah, this is the world. The world's big enough, guys, for for all of us to be producing this material. I'm never going to be able to to do it all, but somebody needs to get the whole collection of William Corliss and just start putting all that information on YouTube so, so everybody can see how profound this is. All right, so we have three more I'm going to show you before I get into the presentation. Ancient structures, again, again remarkable stuff but these are from the historical record all the all the archaeology in this book and all the, the illustrations all all the things that are found these are this is Sum, this is sumer akkad this is ancient israel this is egypt south america Urmbaba valley yansi valley of china all of this is recognizable history even if it's an anomaly even if it's very unusual about how technologically advanced some of these structures are so I have to show you this so you understand just how incredibly amazing this is because this is not recognizable. Whatever culture or civilization that built the things that are seen in this book buried at different levels all over the world isn't anything that we have in the historical record. This comes from an entire different epic before Sumer. Before our recorded history, our entire world was already populated. It was already full of infrastructure. So, and of course, uniformitarians will always have to ignore William Cordes's research on biological anomalies. Yeah, things that do not make, make sense at all, that we are deteriorating and getting smaller and smaller as opposed to the, the uh, idea of of natural selection and, and all that. So those are my book recommendations. Some of them are very hard and difficult to find. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, I needed to get all that out and it took almost an hour, but I needed to get all that out so you will understand just how compelling this scientist who disagreed with Ice Age theory, who for 37 years had been enduring the, the, the fame of Charles Lyle, who got funded and got to watch as all these other, other people in his field signed the contract. And in signing the contract, their books were promoted. Their, their research was promoted and his book fell to the wayside until Jason of Archaics found it in an old PDF or somebody sent it in an email and I just left it alone for about six months. And then when I started reading it, I couldn't stop. So I'm, I'm, I'm all about, you guys already know, I'm all about giving credit where credit is due. And this man's, this man's name and research needs to come back, back to the forefront. It's, it's fascinating. All right, let's see here. <clears throat> Share my screen. Check my chat real quick. I, I, I haven't, had, haven't had a chance to look at my chat, guys. I never do. I'm always talking. My next video is straight Q&A, and it's going to be, I do advanced Q&A from our Archaics Veterans, and I do my Baby Phoenix Q&As. I've always kept them separate, but... Our, probably two days from now, we're going to do a Q&A, probably three, maybe four hours, and we're just going to get a bunch of stuff out. Just going to get a bunch of stuff out, and it's going to be open to all. It's going to, it's going to be, it's going to be for my, for my advanced, um, for, it's going to be for our Kegs veterans and baby Phoenixes, but we're just going to do a universal Q&A, which I don't think I've ever done one before. Not like that. Squirrel Sniper, thank you for providing the free PDFs. If you can find them all, it's awesome. I'm not on Instagram. There are, there are people masquerading as me on Facebook and Instagram. That is not me. Don't fall for that shit. It's not me on Instagram, and it's not me on uh, Facebook, and I don't interact on Telegram at all. I have a Telegram, 
but I haven't been on there in over a year. I think I'm locked out of it. Evolution Cruncher and the other, those other books, Charles Fort, William Corliss. Yeah. Now, Charles Fort, no, 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 no. Charles Fort, for those of you who really want to get your start in, a, in all this type of material to blow your mind about how odd our world truly is, Charles Fort, Charles Fort is where you start. He wrote all those books a hundred years ago. 500 years of data all put together. Charles Fort, the complete the complete works of Charles Fort should cost you $20, $30. Uh, unless you can find a free PDF, it's $20 or $30. You can get them off Amazon. You can get them everywhere. That book is still popular. I just happened to have an, uh, an old one that I just showed you. But that book is very popular. I, get, I think I gave my paperback. I have a brand new paperback version. I'm almost positive I gave it to Big John because I got the old one. All right, guys, let's get into this 1871. I, I've kept you on hold long enough. <coughs> yeah, anybody anybody able to provide those links to, to any of the books that I'm talking about, please do so so people don't have to spend their money on it. All right. Let's see here. Better talk out loud or I'll mess something up. I'm sharing my screen. Share the big screen. All right. Put you guys right back in my business. There we go. All right. So move moving on. Moving through. <clears throat> I'm gonna read to you, then I'm gonna provide the commentary. Why, why, what's relevant, why it's relevant. So, for as the Southern Hemisphere indicates the absence of water in the South in recent prehistoric times, so does the North present evidence of the former existence of much more water than it now contains. The prairies of North America, the plains of Europe, and a large part of Asia were recently under sea. In my videos, we are not the first, part one and part two. I show you guys footage I took. I recorded with my camera in the van of the broken landscape of New Mexico and Arizona to Southern California. And in there, I'm giving you commentary showing you, look guys, you need to wrap your mind around what you're looking at. The reason New Me West Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and Southern California look this way is because in recent times, all of this was under sea. This was the bottom of an ocean. The, all, this all this geography and, and geological features demonstrate that this was under extreme pressure underwater for a long period of time. And it was only recently that it drained out. So... I had I had I had shown all that and showed other books that were talking about that other scientists and researchers uh, who said the same thing about New Mexico, Arizona, and Southern California before I ever read this book. This guy says the same thing, but he even goes further. He says that the entire northern hemisphere, everything everything north of the equatorial ring. And just so we can all be on the same page, this man's idea, what he's about to present as the reason why these world destructions occur with water, works perfectly on both the globe and the flat earth model. Doesn't matter what your paradigm is, because all the activity happens at the ring of the equator. The on a globe model, it's called the equatorial bulge. On the flat Earth model, it's just the it's just the zero degree whatever. It's the it's the uh, uh, not the prime meridian, but it's the uh, it's the zero degree parallel. It's a ring that separates the north from the south. So this man's idea. He believed the world was a globe. He, he was educated in uniformitarian. Even though he broke away from it, he still had that education. Well, what he's saying happens is astonishing. But the evidence, the very first thing we read right here, is that he's telling you that all over North America, 
all over Europe and Asia is the evidence of the bottom of ocean beds at, at a very recent time. For those of you, for those of you who don't know, 99% of the cultures that go back 5,000, 4,000, and 3,000 years are all located north of the equator. That's right. The southern hemisphere, except for a, a little strip of land in South America, has always been almost completely barren. There's a reason for this. Let's move on. The very extensive prevalence of the waters where now they are not from the Arctic regions to the Great Sahara is undeniable. Well, this is a scientist basically telling you that in the Northern Hemisphere, it is undeniable. Every bit of this was, was recently. Now, when you're talking, when you're talking, when a scientist says recently, he's talking in terms of thousands or tens of thousands of years, not like the, you know, not those steeped in uniformitarianism who are talking about hundreds of thousands and millions of years. His idea is something very recent. Proofs of the sudden and violent change in the structure of the Earth's surface are to be found. As Cuvier judged in the frozen carcasses of animals in the north, and in the opinion of the same distinguished man, the evidence also exists of a great deluge a few thousand years ago. That's a hell of a statement. It completely defies the uniformitarian model. Now, the fact that he mentions the frozen carcasses, this is interesting. You guys know that 2.5 million mammoths have been found in the permafrost. They're perfectly preserved. They're frozen in Siberia. Now, more megafauna, like, like the giant wolf, the, the saber-toothed tiger, the three-toed sloth, the giant, the giant two-horned boar, the, uh, what is it, the, the Miocene horse. It's called the Miocene horse, but it's megafauna. It was alive at the same time as the woolly mammoth. Same time at the same time as the woolly rhinoceros. They have all been found in the permafrost of Alaska, Canada, and Russia. This is all this is all this is all getting very close to the Arctic Circle. So uh, these these frozen animals are all, all been found in the north. They're 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 direct evidence of the phenomena that he's going to be describing. We may therefore assume that such a deluge as Cuvier and others find to have been among the comparatively recent phenomena of the globe. Best explains the scattered boulders which have hitherto been regarded as the great proof of glacial action, and also most of the alluvial deposits which are strewn over all the earth. So, he's saying that there's a mechanism that floods the entire northern hemisphere to such a degree that it kills everything. Only in the northern hemisphere, it floods the entire northern hemisphere, and uh, the distribution of boulders that has been that has been the evidence that was used by uniformitarians to promote ice age theory is completely undone because they're, they are shown to have been blown the wrong way. This is critical to understand. This man spent a lot of time showing how, yeah, we got boulders in different areas, but the uniformitarians are trying to say that these boulders are because uh, uh, glaciers of ice came came from the north toward the south and deposited the boulders. But the, but the distribution of boulders shows that they moved in the opposite direction. They came from southerly places and were pushed north. This is critical to understanding this amazing phenomenon that he's going to describe. Old shells have been washed out of their graves and mixed with newer shells, rendering doubtful as Sir C. Lyle Charles Lyell admits the evidence of shells and strata. All these last cited facts, and with them the entire disappearance of the huge mammals of a recent age, which are puzzles, 
if not contradictions, to orthodox geologists are fully accounted for by a nearly universal deluge. Now, he does quite, quote Charles Lyle a lot, but he's also very critical of him. His whole book is critical of Charles Lyle. But <clears throat> what we find interesting here is that in Mexico, remember, the megafauna had been found with human skeletons in pyramid architecture uh, infrastructures that have been buried. This has been found in Mexico. Also, the mound builder civilization of Ohio. Yeah, geometrical mounds that, that are made of precision. Yeah, they've they got trees on them and all now, but they didn't back then. That whole civilization also, uh, um, until the Smithsonian got involved, that civilization was producing skeletons that were seven and a half to nine foot tall. Human skeletons. And in the graves were found smoking pipes made of carved mammoth bone and rhinoceros horn. Yeah, showing that these that these creatures were there. There there has also been one find reported by an Ma American antiquarian of mammoth bones in Cahokia. That's the mound builder civilization. So we're talking about something that's far more recent than uniformitarians would ever admit. We're talking about humans living during the same period as the megafauna, using the megafauna as steeds and and beasts of burden, cohabit cohabit cohabitation with the mega megafauna. We may therefore assume that such a deluge as Cuvier and others find to have been among the comparatively recent phenomena of the globe best explains the scattered boulders. Did I just read that? Yep, did read it. It's twice. All right. The American Pampas is a district three times as large as the whole of France, and it is a vast deposit of mud in which are entombed mammiferous remains in wonderful abundance. I just told you that earlier, guys. Woolly rhinoceros, Miocene horse, three-toed sloth, giant, the the the, the giant uh, wolf. I can't remember what his name was. Huge, like the dire wolf. It's called the dire wolf. The dire wolf, uh, the mastodon, the, the uh, woolly rhinoceros, the woolly mammoth, all these. Uh, this is the mammiferous. The giant beaver, giant skunks, all that. Mam mammiferous remains in wonderful abundance. One cause alone can explain its existence. Namely, a deluge sufficiently vast to leave behind as it surged and rolled to the mouth of what is now La Plata. That prodigious residuum of mud and animals which its mighty force had swept from the north. This is, this is very critical to understand what's going on here. It's amazing. It's amazing. He is describing, he is describing that all these animals, well, he describes it later. They're all dead and they're all floating. And they're coming down from the north as they're being deposited. Waters keep going to back toward the equator. You'll understand in a minute. It's amazing. The clay deposit of the Pampas is one of the most beautiful geological facts and deserving of careful investigation. I think the huge mammifers of the Pampas are not in their birthplace and that they have been born thither, not by flowing streams, but through a geological convulsion which destroyed them all at a stroke. I've provided evidence for this on my channel. Remember the mammoths that were frozen in place with buttercups still on their tongues, undigested? Yeah. Giant woolly rh rhinos that have been found standing right next to an apple tree, frozen solid, and then embedded in the permafrost. It's all been found, and a whole lot more. The immediate result would be the destruction of all the living creatures of that part of the world and the vast clay deposits of the pampas. If it were not so, it would be hard to conceive of and explain two important facts. The sudden and simultaneous annihilation of the huge terrestrial animals which inhabited the American continents and the immense accumulation of Pampean mud. The Pampean earth is the last, is the last deposit 
of great importance, which preceded the existing epic. Meaning, all this has been found under this massive layer of mud that's been frozen in the north. Our world is built on top of it. So it's very interesting. That's a, that's a double. It is that of Dr. Edmund Hitchcock, who says that all of the northern parts of the American continent have been swept over by a powerful current from the northwest to the southeast. The diluvial waters must have been oceanic. What other agency could have here produced a current 2,000 miles in width? There is no reason to suppose the inequalities of surface which now exist were essentially different at the epoch of diluvial action, for we find the boundaries uniformly obstructed in their path, just as they would have been if the present mount I cut something off, if the present mountains had been there. So it, wa it wasn't just part of North America. The entire North American continent had been flooded. But the depositing of all the Pampean mud and the depositing of all the hundreds of millions of mammalian forms came from the north. The destruction came from the south. But all these mammals came from the north and were deposited. This is going to be explained. The, ex the explanation almost slaps you in the face when you hear it. We're not talking about reptiles and amphibians being deposited. We're talking about ma mammalian life forms being deposited. All right. I am unable to see how glacial agency could have transported detritus in a southerly direction several hundred miles over nearly all the most elevated ridges of the American continent and even have driven it upwards along slopes considerably inclined as appears to have been done on the western side of New England. All right, he's, he's quoting somebody. He, this is not him saying this. You can, see the, you can see the quotation marks on the bottom. There's another scientist he's quoting who is baffled saying, I am unable to see how all these bodies of mammalian life forms could have been deposited at such great height throughout the Americas. I don't, I'm unable to understand how all this happened um, uh, concerning, uh, oh, concerning the water coming from the north. And that's what this guy is going to describe. In following the profound reflections of Mons Adamar, we are constrained to admit that it has been established beyond doubt that the immediate cause of the cataclysm, which is known by the name of Noah's flood, was a disturbance of the equilibrium of the ocean, the inevitable consequence of a change of its center of gravity. I don't know if it was Noah's flood and nor does he, but Noah's flood in 1871 was really the only flood that anybody ever talked about. They weren't talking about the Ogaijian deluge. They weren't talking about the Gihon flood. And they weren't talking about the, the, the uh, capture flood when the moon appeared. They were just, well, Hans, Hans Horberger was talking about the capture flood at this time. And then in 1901, 1902, Hans, Hans uh, uh, Bellamy picked up the torch on that. But still, he's talking about a great flood. He just said Noah's flood. It could be, it, could, it might, might not be. So the inevitable consequence of a change of the center of gravity, this is key. This is amazing because it shows why this destruction was done the way it was. And what has happened probably many times can be safely calculated to happen again and from the same causes. We're going to get to those causes in a minute. Blew my mind when I read it. The ocean will take repossession of its former bed in the Northern Hemisphere. The South Pacific, South Atlantic, and Antarctic Oceans will be suddenly poured across the equator and submerge the Northern Hemisphere, the high grounds rising above the level of the Southern Ocean, will form the archipelago of a new Polynesia. 
Australia, excuse me, Australia, by the Great Barrier Reef being laid dry, will be joined to New Guinea and thus acquire a new eastern seaboard 1,200 miles long. This is amazing, guys. I have explained to you over and over that after 2040, Australia is going to be prime real estate. I've been telling you that for three and a half years, way before I read this book. That after 2040, because of a 30 degree shift, Australia is going to be in a prime area, but his what he's revealing is far deeper, and it may completely change my own output once I consider everything he's talking about. It doesn't change the fact that Australia is prime real estate. It changes the dynamic as to why. He is explaining that this phenomenon at the equator depressurizes underground and forces the equatorial bulge to go down and cause it's the only thing holding back the southern hemisphere oceans. There is far, he explains, there is far more water in the southern hemisphere than in the northern hemisphere. There's less land, therefore there's way more water in the southern hemisphere. He says a, depressurize, a depressurization event causes the equatorial bulge in a series of earthquakes to just go down. And as soon as it goes down, it creates a tsunami at the equator of pressure incoming from the southern hemisphere and a, a tsunami overtakes almost all of the northern hemisphere destroying everything collecting it all at the north pole collecting all the dead bodies all all the floating mammalian life forms reptiles and amphibians sink all of the bloating mammalian life forms are concentrated as the tidal waves come in, come in closer to the, to the North Pole, and then the waters equal out and they have to return. But as the waters are returning, all the mammalian islands of, of fused together, rotting, bloated mammalian megafauna. Islands of them are floating together, concentrated, and they get deposited all over North America, Russia, and Europe as the waters recede back to the equator. Once the waters go all the way back, the pressure is built back up and the entire equatorial, equatorial area just raises just a little bit like it is today. It's called the equatorial bulge. What's really interesting is is I don't, you guys know that I don't believe in NASA. I don't believe in, I don't, I believe it's an intelligence organization. They're full of shit. But it's so weird how they put all this real minute minutia, this data about Mars out and, and all these topographical features of Mars. And even if Mars is absolute fiction, we've never seen anything there at all. It's very interesting that they claim that Mar Mars has an equator that has a bulge on it and that it seems to be artificial. It's very interesting. Very interesting. So this is what he's describing. He's literally describing that there's a cycle, and in this cycle, there's a. It's a simple. It's a simple. It's as simple as the equatorial ring, just going down to be level with the rest of the world, instead of being a bulge, and it just causes this massive flooding because there's nothing to hold back the pressure of the southern oceans. There's way more water and at greater depths, and it just comes in, washes the northern hemisphere completely. Then it deposits all the boulders and deposits all the water and all that stuff as it reverses back in, in the world to new heavens and a new earth, a whole new world. It's, uh, I mean, if you want to get poetic about it, God baptizes the earth. It's a whole, it's a whole, whole new life for the world, <clears throat> basically killing most of the stuff that's here. It's crazy, but that's that's his uh, this is where he's going with all this all this information. The greater part of England, Scotland, and Ireland will become what they were before the last catastrophe, which acted in the opposite direction. Unknown continents will emerge from the ocean abyss of the south. What he is describing here may be knowledge that the elite already possess. And I know some of you get offended with the word elite, but what are we going to call them? What are we going to call them? 
So they're buying up all this real estate in Australia and New Zealand. Why? Why? What do they know? According to this scientific model right here, which was suppressed in favor of a lie, uniformitarianism that was funded in these days right here, we had the Rockefellers and Carne Carnegie's and the Rothschilds rising in power. Did they know about this? Did they suppress this guy's research? Because he was on it. According to him, the next time this depressurization event happens, the Southern Hemisphere, Australia is going to increase in size by four times. New Zealand will, will, will be merged with them. Ta I mean, New Zealand will be merged with it. Tasmania will be merged with Africa. Africa will get way bigger. The Southern Hemisphere will have all the land masses. The Northern Hemisphere will just be islands. Yeah, this is what he's describing. The Northern Hemisphere is going to be the empty hemisphere on the next cycle. And then <clears throat> all the civilizations will, will, uh, will, be, will develop in the southern hemisphere this time. So this is what he's trying. He's talking about a cycle and that all the geological and geographical evidence shows that this is the cycle and that ice ages don't exist. This is what he's showing. As a matter of fact, the mountains will not rise, but the effect will be the same by the retiring of the sea from the southern half of the Earth's surface, thus placing the continental hemisphere on the southern instead of, as at present, on the northern side of the equator. This is an absolute, absolute total destruction of the northern hemisphere. At a glance at a map of the world informs us that the mass of water is very unequally proportioned out between the northern and southern halves of the globe. In the northern hemisphere, the land bears to the sea the proportion of 415 to 1,000. In the southern, of 129 to 1,000. So, that is hugely disproportionate. Meaning, there is way more land mass in the north of the equator, and there is way more water, ocean, south of the equator. And that this is how... This cycle balances things out. It literally allows civilizations and human development and animals and all that stuff to thrive in one hemisphere, as we've seen for the past 5,000 years. For the past 5,000 years, all the civilizations of antiquity were north of the uh, were north of the equator, except a small little band right there, Tiwanaku, right there in South America. Yeah, guys, it's crazy crazy. The next one, they're all going to be in the southern hemisphere, and the northern hemisphere is going to be barren. A glance at a map of the world, and fall, okay, I, I got a couple doubles in here, I'm sorry about that. Torn from his bed, old ocean carried with him his mud with which he formed the extensive lands of transport which constitute the diluvium. Gigantic streams of water mingled with earth, sand, and pebbles formed the alluviums of the great valleys. Finally, erratic boulders sustained by the ice were raised by the piling up of the Arctic waters to the altitudes they now occupy and remained shelved on the sides of mountains whose tops they were unable to scale. Thus was produced the last deluge. About 4,200 years ago. He's dating the Great Flood. He's, da he's dating the Great Flood of Noah. I don't know if what he's describing is the Great Flood of Noah. I have my doubts. I think it's something bigger. I think it's the Adam and Eve reset cataclysm or the 5239 BC uh, year one of the Anuna calendar that I've told you guys so much about and showed you in charts. I think it's bigger. So, uh, which is commonly known as the delusion. Everyone has heard of the extraordinary object found in the last century on the banks of the Lena, North Siberia. 
The ice, in melting, exposed the body of a mastodon in such perfect preservation that dogs ate its flesh until Dr. Clark conveyed the skeleton to St. Petersburg, Russia, in the museum of which it now stands. Buffon mentioned six elephants preserved in the ice near the Ohio in America. I can't pronounce this. Sari Shu discovered an, another on the banks of Alasia, a large river which empties itself into the icy sea. In short, there is scarcely a canton in Siberia which does not contain the bones of elephants. The islands on the icy sea furnish enormous quantities, which is put forward as a proof that this drear region was at one period possessed of a genial climate. If, as geologists assert, coal is derived from vegetable matter grown in situ and then submerged, how are we to account for the Arctic regions being so abundantly provided with coal that it is found cropping out from the sides of the sandstone cliffs? and water-worn nodules of that mineral cumbering the beaches over large areas. So, I'm going to talk about that coal real quick. What we have is a scenario. The very fact that coal has been found underneath these clay deposits, underneath these, these, these uh, uh, basically islands, islands of bones, what had happened was all the water came from all the water of the southern hemisphere dumped into the northern hemisphere, overtook all the continents while exposing dry land to the southern hemisphere. But it had to go back. Once it hit, once it hit the Arctic and compressed all the all the floating detritus, and it and this took this took days, maybe even weeks, the water starts going back. As it's going back, the bloated, the bloated, decayed remains of hundreds of millions of mammalian life forms were fused together as they were rotting and floating in these waters. They are deposited as islands. Oh, this is how they've been found. All over the Northern Hemisphere, bone yards full of megafauna have been excavated. Then they've been buried under this diluvium, this clay, all this silt that just came down, water's drained out, the sun baked the area, and nobody knew any of that was down there for a long period of time. But underneath that are clay, I mean, are coal deposits that are packed full of human artifacts and some with human remains. How do we account for that? I'm going to tell you. The evidence, the evidence suggested by all this data that I just showed you in these books, the fact that coal is packed with human artifacts, tells me that the world was burned. Human civilization was burned. It's complete. This is coal. This is ashes. This is ashes, wood, all organic materials, people, animals, all kinds of stuff, all their belongings. Everything is it's roasted. It burns. When it but once it burns, it layers were deposited on top of it. A lot of these layers above coal is red dirt. It's all over this coal. A lot of times coal is found in red dirt. My, my archaics veterans know exactly what I'm talking about. These, these, there's been a lot of YouTube videos showing these red dirt deposits. They're huge all over the place. But coal is found underneath them. So we have a infrastructure that is populated by humans and megafauna. It is completely burned. The world is burned. It's destroyed by fire, not by flood. It's destroyed by fire. It's gone. And then all of a sudden, the southern hemisphere implodes. A tsunami from the equator, all the way around the equator, a tsunami all at once takes over the entire northern hemisphere, washes away all life, and then deposits the dead floating mammalian carcasses all over this area. And uh, as the water recedes, all these islands of bones are set, are set in place. 
the water goes back to the southern hemisphere and a whole new cycle begins. This is what this this is the picture that all this data presents. And his his whole idea is that um the southern hemisphere is what is is what flooded the northern hemisphere and that the and that there was a reverse period reversal period and now it's time for the southern hemisphere to again flood the northern hemisphere it's getting that time so I already got that one let's see we arrive at the conclusion that grand deluges are periodical all right He's mentioning the procession of the equinoxes, but that's but then again, you guys know how I feel about that. I haven't found any evidence of it. I cite I cite all these historic texts talking about the pole stars and all that. I haven't found any evidence of it. Seems like a real nice theory, but I haven't seen anybody be able to demonstrate it. All right. And we find on inspection that the earth has actually been ravaged by a succession of general cataclysms. Allusion has been made to the to the extinct elephants referred to by Sir Roderick Murchison in his address to the Royal Geographical Society for 1866. The heads of which, he says, were for the most part turned towards the south. That is so important, guys. Tens of millions, thousands, maybe thousands, maybe tens of millions of all these megafauna were facing the south when they died. Told you, man, it's extremely important. Remember, some of them were frozen solid. As if the animals had been retreating southward when caught, either by an inundation proceeding from the north polar regions or by a change of climate due to a wide elevation of land, whereby their former pasture grounds became converted into the frozen soil in which the mammoths have been preserved to this day. They were flash frozen, guys. They were flash frozen. Preserved in place, and they're entombed and buried there by the flooding. All northern Siberia, which is now glacial, was, during the age in which the, the mammoth lived, covered with a, veg a vegetation adequate to support vast hordes of these animals, even up to the 75th degree of north latitude. We're talking about a vast horde of mammalian life forms that don't just require a lot of vegetation, they require a tremendous amount of oxygen. This is what they needed. If they're all facing the south, if they were all facing the south when they were flash frozen, it's probably because instinct, they have visceral instincts, they probably knew that the, the, the danger was approaching from the equator. The danger was approaching. They probably couldn't see it. They're animals. Probably couldn't see it. Didn't know what, but instinct told them face south, something was wrong. They just didn't realize there's a 300 foot tall tsunami coming, coming at about 450 miles an hour toward them. But before it even reached them, they were flash frozen. Why? Why were creatures flash frozen toward, toward, the, uh, toward the North Pole and not at the equator where the tsunami began. Well, that's really easy to answer because it was a vapor canopy that collapsed. And, and we've been through multiple presentations about what happens when a vapor canopy collapses. When that vapor canopy collapses, all that moisture up there, flash freezes, everything at the extremities toward the poles. So this is a, this guy, this guy's, Put it, this guy's amazing material he's putting putting out. It's for 1871, it's phenomenal. So I finished that. Let's see. As if the animals have been retreating, let's see, southward when caught, either by an inundation proceeding from the north polar regions or by a change of climate due to a wide elevation of land whereby their former pasture grounds became converted into the frozen soil in which the mammoths have been preserved to this day. All right, we got all that. 
because fossil vegetation and animal remains proper to a temperate climate are now found in the boreal regions, they hold that those now frigid lands must at one time have enjoyed such a semi-tropical climate as we now have in the south of Europe. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. Under the vapor canopy, there was no North Pole. Remember, we have maps of Antarctica from the 14th, 15th, and 1600s. Maps of Antarctica, ice-free, that show the rivers, valleys, and mountains. And we have reports from the U.S. Navy Geological Survey Office that those old maps are literally accurate compared to, to the soundings that the U.S. Ge Geological Survey has done in Antarctica, saying that those mountains and those valleys and those, and those uh, uh uh, rivers are basically exactly where they're supposed to be. The maps are accurate. How is that possible? It's two mile high ice cap there today. How is it possible? It's possible because we've had multiple vapor canopies. And every time a vapor canopy collapses, it creates it creates all, all that two mile high ice cap because when the vapor canopy collapses, the extremities freeze. The extremities freeze. God, that's where all, all it came from. Because remember, it's not snowing in Antarctica. It's not snowing in the Arctic. You got to understand, this is why Ice Age theory is, there's 59 or 60 different theories. They can't figure out where all the snow came from. Yeah, guys. A half an inch a year of snow falls in Antarctica and the Arctic. A half an inch. That's not enough at all to produce two mile high snow caps. This is why uniformitarians say that those snow caps have been there. It took hundreds of thousands of years to build up. They have to say that to support their model, but it's not true. How do we know it's not true? Because we have maps of Antarctica that show there was no, are you going to tell me that those cartographers made those maps 250,000 years ago? Are you going to say that they made those maps 25,000 years ago? This is how ridiculous uniformitarianism is. It's dumb. Let's see. The habitat of vast herds of gigantic animals whose consumption of food would be so great that none but a semi-tropical climate with its quick and succulent growth of vegetation could have supplied their wants. There it is. The North Pole was under a vapor canopy, meaning the animals could have had plenty of oxygen because of their size, and they had plenty of flora to feed on. How do we know? Because we have seen, we've, we've excavated them. We have excavated under the permafrost apple trees of gigantic size, of all kinds of plants. What is it? Spur, Spurgeon? I can't remember. You guys know. Many of you know what I'm talking about. There's an island in the Arctic called, called uh, Spitz. Lurgin or something. All of those. It's like a whole forest found underneath the ice. It's crazy. He might mention it here. I can't remember. Mammoth was clothed with hair to enable it to dwell in a cold climate. Therefore, it did dwell in the cold North, uh, North Siberia. We take leave to object to that deductive conclusion. I love this guy. So he's basically saying that uniformitarians are trying to claim to support Ice Age theory that Mammoths had long hair. It's called a woolly mammoth and also the woolly rhinoceros. They had long hair, and that long hair was taken as evidence by the uniformitarians trying to promote Ice Age theory as to protect them from the Arctic cold. He says, we take leave to object to that deductive conclusion. The Indian bear has an exceedingly thick coat of hair, yet it chiefly inhabits the, hot, inha inhabits the hottest part of India. Now, what this guy did not know in 1871 is that research in the 1990s has concluded now that the hair follicles in the skin of the woolly mammoth and the woolly rhinoceros, the hair was designed as a cooling system. It had nothing to do with protecting from the cold. As a matter of fact, many tropical species of mammalian and marsupial life forms are shaggy. They have a lot of hair. So... He was right in 1871 to object, but he used the Indian bear as an example, not knowing that that almost all tropical animals are an example of uh, of that being some really ridiculous thinking that long hair is for the Arctic only. It's crazy. 
All right, so question ball, okay. No such extreme northern winter season would have permitted the growth of food in sufficient quantities for such huge feeders. This is a very valid point. It absolutely supports vapor canopy. No such extreme northern winter season would have permitted the growth of food in sufficient quantities for such huge feeders. There is also the important difficulty of light. When the boreal regions would be enwrapped in their long winter darkness, vegetation would cease. Thus, this important objection exists even if we put aside the question of climate. Remember in the book of Genesis, remember, seasons, the rainbow, did not appear until the Great Flood. And in the archaic research, I show the Great Flood was what? The collapse of the vapor canopy. Is he describing the flood of 2239 BC of Noah? I doubt it. I doubt it. I believe he's describing something far worse. 3895 BC, Adam and Eve reset. Genesis 1. But I could be wrong. He could be describing, he could be, this whole scenario he's describing could be uh, 5239 BC, year one of the Anuna calendar. I don't know. I'm even open to the fact that he could be describing 2239 BC, which means that the whole entire history of the 1656 years of the pre-flood world did not happen anywhere near the Near East. It would have happened in the Southern Hemisphere. And this is what we get in the Sumerian records. Remember the Sumerian records are very clear. Where did the Anuna come from? Where did the Sumerians claim that these amazing people came by ship? Where did they come from? They came by way of Dilmun. Where is that? You're coming straight out by ship from the southern hemisphere to use Bahrain as a staging area before they entered the Tigris-Euphrates and then colonized Egypt, colonized India, Mohenjo-Daro, Harappa, Larik, colonized Canaan, colonized Turkey, colonized uh, all of the Tigris-Euphrates. It makes sense. It means the pre-flood world would have been in the southern hemisphere and this is why we can't find any of those ruins why because the southern hemisphere is almost all water so i'm just i'm just bouncing ideas off guys i'm not yet convinced that this massive flooding he describes is what noah's flood was but i am absolutely convinced that he is that he has found uh, uh that he is basically describing how 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 the the, the this reset cycle really occurs. I'm not talking about the 138 year Phoenix phenomenon. I'm talking about the big reset. So it's very interesting. I find this fascinating. But he's right about the climate. Yeah. Hundreds of millions of mammals require that size, require a lot of oxygen, and they also require a lot of food in seasons would have prevented them from being able to eat the way they need to. There's too many skeletons. It shows too the abundance of mammalian life forms is, is massive. So we have a vapor canopy. And under the vapor canopy, everything grows larger. Remember the plants, the animals, and it solves the polar light problem because under a vapor canopy, sunlight is diffused throughout the entire, the entire sky. The polar region would have been would, would have been darker, but it still would have got that ultraviolet light that it needed. Under the vapor canopy, which the Native Americans called the dark purple light period, spider grandmother had her web over the sky. Remember that. Her web dropped the necessary dew to make sure that there was enough water, but it didn't rain. Genesis says the same thing. There was no rain in the pre-flood period. So just connecting the dots. Among the latest discoveries relating to the assumed ancient climate of the North Polar regions is the natural history of fossil plants recently discovered by Mr. Wimper. That's a hell of a name. Mr. Mr. Wimper, whose collection consists of 95 species indicative of a climate similar to South Italy. Wow. The ancient climate of the North Polar regions, according to these 95 specimens found by this guy in the permafrost, here it is. Same climate as 
South Italy. What is he saying? He's saying the North Pole was Mediterranean climate. That's what he's saying. Again, vapor canopy. Again, why why were, were hundreds of millions of life forms in the North all facing South? They weren't running. We didn't find them in the permafrost running. They were frozen solid. Why? They faced South because that's where the destruction was coming. But before, but before that tsunami could reach them, the collapse of the vapor canopy instantly froze the northern regions. They were frozen in place. Once they were frozen in place, the tsunami came and buried them. The more we advance towards the north of Russia, the more extensive are the fossil bones of the elephants met with. Travelers tell us of islands in the icy sea, which are literally a conglomerate of ice, mud, sand, and bones. Billings Voyage, speaking of one of these, what is that? Indigerka, must be Russian, Indigerka, situated opposite this island of bones, situated opposite the mouth of the Lena, says the whole island, which is about 33 leagues long, is all bones. Except three or four small rocky mountains is a mixture of ice, bones, and sand. And as the shores fall from the heat of the sun's rays thawing them, the tusks and bones of the mammoth are found in great abundance. Guys, I haven't, hold on, I haven't checked my chat in a while. Okay, everything going good? Great. I'm going to finish out. One hour and 49 minutes. Man, I can't believe I made good time like that. Still got a few more stills to go over. All right, I'm sharing my screen to finish finish up. All right. All right. So we got. Every year during the summer, innumerable fishermen's barks direct their course towards the Isle of Bones. And during the winter, immense caravans take the same route. All the convoys are drawn by dogs, and they return laden with mammoth tusks, each weighing from 150 to 200 pounds. Some have been found which weighed 350 pounds. That's a hell of a tusk. The fossil ivory from the Isle of Bones has served as a quarry for this valuable material for export to China for the past 500 years. And it has been exported to Europe for upwards of 100 years. That's amazing. That's amazing. Locals have been digging all these animals out. Of late years, we have obtained convincing proofs that the mammoth and many other extinct mammalian species, very common in caves, occur also in undisturbed alluvium. Embedded in such a manner with works of art as to leave no room for doubt that man and the mammoths coexisted and also died together. Wow. This is a scientist telling us that in these flood deposits, the mammalian life forms of the megafauna are found among human artifacts of art, showing that mankind and the megafauna coexisted. But we already knew this. We knew this from Mexico. We knew this from Acambaro. We've already known. We've already, we knew this from Cahokia. And, and, and other discoveries. But it's good to see it in this book, 1871. But one circumstance more convincing than any other is related by Dr. Schmerling. From all the indications he found in the 40 caverns he explored, in some of which the bones of man and of extinct animals were found together, 
the bones of man so rolled and scattered as to preclude all idea of their having been intentionally buried on the spot. It was manifest that the organic and the inorganic contents of the caverns had been swept into them by streams communicating with the surface of the country. Land shells, fresh water fish, a, a snake, as well as the bones of several birds were amongst the mass, probably rolled in the beds of streams before they had reached their cavernous destination. What we have here is a scientist who, after excavating 40 caves, found humans and mammalian and avian life forms all mixed together so perfectly that he concluded these were not natural interments, that a, that a flood had happened, and that because they were, these were caves, they filled up with water, and, and flowing into those caves were all these bloated carcasses of humans and animals. And they just went in there, and as the water went down, it deposited all, all of these Feated, bloated, broken carcasses that were all fused together of human and, and, and megafauna and birds, and that's where he found them. He says these were not natural; uh, these weren't natural burials. This was the result of a cataclysm. Professor Huxley remarks. There can be no doubt that the physical geog geography of Europe has changed wonderfully since the bones of men, mammoths, hyenas, and the rhinoceros were washed pell-mell into the cave of Ingress. Sir Charles Lyle confesses, that after a very patient examination of the comparative antiquity of the fossils, it is impossible to come to any other conclusion than that man was introduced into the world at an earlier period than geologists have believed. This is uniformitarian brainwashing. This is Sir Charles Lyell, father of uniformitarianism. Listen, this guy here, father of the geologic column, this is absolute bullshit what this man just said sir charles lyle confesses that after a very patient examination of the comparative antiquity of the fossils it is impossible to come to any other conclusion than that man was introduced into the world at an earlier period than geologists have believed the truth is just the opposite that the Fossils were created in a more recent period than geologists will admit. It's just the opposite. Charles Lyell is the origin of this great deceit of uniformitarianism. This is an anti-catastrophist perspective. Catastrophism is revealing the truth. The entire fact that their fossils all fuse together, man and megafauna, is catastrophism. Charles Lyle repackages it, trying to make it sound like this all happened 250,000 years ago. It just shows us, oh, modern man is older than we thought. Modern man may be older than our older than we than than we thought, but that but that's not what his intent was in making this statement. This is a uniformitarian statement. It's a lie. For example. The philosophic Darwin, in his researches, says it is impossible to reflect on the changed state of the American continent without the deepest astonishment. The mind at first is irresistibly hurried, excuse me, hurried into the belief of some great catastrophe. But thus to destroy animals, both large and small, in Patagonia, for example, up to Bering Straits, we must shake the entire framework of the globe. Charles Darwin is also poisonous. He's casting doubt. He's literally trying to trying to paint any picture of doubt other other than the truth, which is catastrophism. Read. Let me read it again. Charles Darwin in his this is philosophic Darwin. It is impossible to reflect on the change state of the American continent without the deepest astonishment. He's astonished. Why? Because he's not a catastrophist. He's astonished. Why? Because 
The American continent shows nothing but catastrophism. So he says the mind at first is irresistibly hurried into the belief of some great catastrophe. Do you see the doubt he's, he, 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 he's injecting into his statement as if there's another truth and that catastrophism isn't real? This isn't the result of a catastrophe. Therefore, they import uniformitarianism. This is why almost every scientist alive today is a dumbass. None of them do their own research. None of them go back and look at the findings of predecessors to find out how this poison of uniformitarianism was introduced into the field and funded. I, I just don't have any respect for them, guys. I can't. More over and over and over and over. The more I read from these original scientific thinkers, the more I find out uh, of this of this toxic poison that was that was introduced into the field by these men. Yeah, right here. It's crazy. The mind at first is irresistibly hurried into the belief of some great catastrophe. Every part of that sentence, the syntax, infers that some great catastrophe isn't what happened here. But they don't offer what happened. So it's crazy, guys. Yeah. We would have to shake the entire framework of the globe. That is the point of uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism absolutely tries to kill any idea of worldwide catastrophe. This is the point of uniformitarianism. It had always been the point. Everything you see is a process that took hundreds of thousands to millions of years. Yeah. Everything you see, the entire world, every 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 system, uh, every development. This is what uniformitarianism promotes. Just the fossils and artifacts found in coal seams completely overturns uniformitarianism. But you'll still get them dumbass guys on YouTube trying to argue it. In order to promote uniformitarianism, you have to ignore thousands of data points thousands of discoveries. You have to ignore all that. No, it's crazy. The whole of Norfolk was made a heap of rubbish composed of every known stratification. If not from deluge causes affecting ocean levels, why is this ever reoccurring 1,200 feet of sea level marks coincident oh, co I guess Marks coincident with the raised beaches in both hemispheres. I don't really understand what he's talking about. I know the whole of Norfolk was made a heap of rubbish. I know that under Norfolk in the UK, under Norfolk is one of the largest coal, coal layers ever found. It extends underneath the Atlantic and connects to continental Europe. But remember what the coal seams really are. They are the burned remains of a pre-existing world that was inhabited by people and animals and their and their and their cities and infrastructure all of it was torched and burned before the tsunami came and washed it all away and buried and buried all the evidence if not from deluge causes affecting ocean levels why is this ever reoccurring 1200 feet of sea level Sea level marks coincident with the raised beaches in both hemispheres. I have to go back. Oh, there it is. So, okay. I'm glad I, I'm glad I focused out. This continues. All right. So the whole of Norfolk was made a heap of rubbish composed of every known stratification of the world, mixed up with pachyderm mammals, serpents, crocodiles, and sharks of the torrid zone, the equator. What were sharks of the equator done deposited toward the North Pole? Because the tsunami came from the equator. In juxtaposition with the walrus, whale, and narwhal of the Arctic Ocean, lying side by side with the horse, wolf, pig, bear, bison, and deer, including the latter species, the large Irish elk. That's amazing. That's amazing. Can you imagine that? Whales, dolphins, sharks, all found side by side with mammal, with, with uh, uh, um, uh, I mean, with, I mean, creatures from the ocean of the equatorial area are found right there in the Arctic, buried with everything else. It's it, these tsunamis washed all life forms to the center, crushed them with pressure. Even sharks were probably crushed under all that weight. Man. 
The most striking peculiarity about this for, uh, forest bed is the extreme contrast between its animal and vegetable remains. The latter, with one or two exceptions, almost exactly resemble the present flora of Great Britain, whereas the former are utterly unlike any animals now living in these islands. All the geological changes above referred to have, therefore, taken place within the lifetime of existing species of plants and trees. This flood that destroyed everything was in the last 5,000 years. That's amazing. What other fluviatile agency except the mighty force set in action by the swift waters of the deluge, alternately from either pole, would satisfactorily account for such dread phenomena as we have elsewhere related. The bare fact of mammaliferous remains of the pachyderms found in North Siberia in a conglomerate of ice, sand, and mud, we consider should to all reasoning minds be indubitable evidence of deluge action. In connection with astronomical signs, we may expect the next deluge from the South Pole. All right, South Pole, guys. He, say, he says all that, water is, all that water is coming from the Southern Hemisphere. So we also think that the day will arrive when the Great Giza Pyramid will be found to have been built as a warning guide to man. The deluge was, was, was threatened in the year of the Hebrew world, 1536, and began December 7th, 1656, and continued 377 days. So he still thinks that what he found and all this evidence is, is the great flood of the Bible. He may be right. He may be wrong. It may be a flood, other floods that I have found that were even before that, mentioned in other ancient texts. So uh, I don't know. But he's absolutely right. 1536 was 120 years before the great flood. That's when Noah was given a warning that, hey, the great flood is coming. 1656 is the exact year on the old world's calendar. Uh, you guys already know that. It's a Phoenix phenomenon number. It's divisible by 138. So it's very interesting. But the most interesting takeaway here is that in 1871, this man connected the Great Pyramid of Egypt to being some type of warning guide to future man of this phenomenon. If you have not seen my Giza playlist, Lost Scriptures of Giza, Lost Secrets of Giza playlist, my pyramid research then this, this right here probably means nothing to you. But my archaics veterans already know just how incredibly special that Great Pyramid is and how it is intrinsically linked to the number 138. Buffon thinks that the Hebrew and Grecian delusions were the same and arose from the Atlantic and Bosphorus bursting into the valley of the Mediterranean. Guys, again, in my older presentations, on my Phoenix Phenomenon presentations, I show you the great flood of 2239 BC is what created the Mediterranean Sea. It also created and bust, it busted right through the Bosphorus and created the Black Sea. It is what destroyed Malta, Gigantium Temple, uh, the Hypogeum, and, and distributed those megalithic, gigantic uh, uh, bricks and blew them all as if a tsunami just wiped them all. And I've, sh I've showed that on, on my channel as well. He may be right. This describes the great flood of Noah. I don't know. I just don't know. But it does describe a, a massive flood. So, just don't know. But I will say this. Man, a great pyramid reference is so awesome. It's just so awesome, guys. Two hours and seven minutes. Ah, it's a Phoenix number. Two hours and seven minutes. My presentation is done. Why is it a Phoenix number? Because 207 is half of 414. 414 is a cursed earth period. 
Our case veterans know what I'm talking about. And if you took 207 years, you'd find out that that many months is also a Phoenix number. Crazy. Ancient Chinese texts, as I show on my charts and in my published books, 207 years the Chinese knew the Great Flood was coming because they saw that all the stars told the story of the world being destroyed. <laughs> Excuse me. The world being destroyed. The flood. There was a five planet alignment and where it happened in which constellation told the Chinese that the Great Flood would, would happen in, in 207 years. I always found that very fascinating because 207 is a Phoenix number. But the Chinese just had it had it a little backwards. But the Chinese had a lot of things backwards. Remember, they called they called the seven kings of the Anuna, the Anunnaki. Oh, uh, they called them the, the dragon kings. And they even date them to the exact time that the Sumerians had. Remember, the seven the 670 years before the flood was the reign of the seven kings. Uh, the reign, and according to the Sumerian prism. The king's list, it specifically says that the seven kings ruled for 241,200 shars or turnings of the stars. That's days, which is only 670 years. The same 670 years mentioned by Nostradamus, who also mentioned the pre-flood period and uh, Phoenix numbers. He also mentioned the Phoenix. So I, I'm going off into other topics right now, guys. This is all my Phoenix phenomenon data. I'm done. That's my presentation. I did this presentation way back, but it was it wasn't good because I had a crowd I had a crowd around me and my audio was absolutely terrible. I just didn't present it right. This time I got to do it and show you a bunch of stuff from these other books and give some shout outs to, to some other books that you can order. And you got access to free downloads. I've seen some PDFs downloaded, uh, some free PDFs to some of those books that I showed you. Uh, even cyclical delusions, you can read more from this book. There is a free PDF online of it, 1871 cyclical cyclical deluge theory. It's an amazing book. I just paraphrased it and showed you some of the crossover. But the greatest takeaway for me out of this whole presentation is the fact. It's the fact that this man in 1871 had had a suspicion that the great flood. I mean, that the Great Pyramid of Egypt is actually some type of monument designed to warn future generations of this mechanism of flooding. And that's exactly what the ancient traditions say the Great Pyramid was built to do. It was built to survive a flood, but also it was built to be decoded by a techn technologically advanced civilization in the future that would figure out what they needed to do to survive the next event. That's what the Great Pyramid is about. All right, guys, I'm hungry. I'm out of coffee. My coffee's cold. Love you guys. Keep that vibration up. I'm gonna reach out to some of the. I'm gonna reach out to some of these. Uh, uh, some of these hosts. You guys gave me a bunch of them. A lot of them are Christian. That's good. Um, you gave me some some really good names in the, in my community post. Uh, who to reach out to? Uh, to talk about the actual date of the Great Flood. I'm I'm really thinking about doing a panel and really see, seeing if several of them want to, want, want, to, want to all chime in on it. But uh, I know the date of the Great Flood and I can easily show it through multiple different uh, data sets. But it's good it's good to, to hear what other people can bring to the table. But uh, we're going to do that. I'm going to reach out to some people. But meanwhile, I'm going to hit this awesome outro and I love you guys. <laughs>